Hi, it's Jan Beta, and today I'm going to try to make some modifications to the power supply for this thing. This thing obviously being a CPC 464 made by Amstrad. Apart from being the widest home computer ever made, I believe, this is also quite a neat machine and it's pretty fun to play with this. I don't have a proper power supply for this. You can use a regular 5 volt power supply. This just has a connector for a regular 5.5 millimeter, 2.1 millimeter inner diameter barrel plug, 5 volt DC center positive. So you can basically use an off the shelf newly produced power supply with these without any issues. I have something else in mind though. We are going to take a look at this Amstrad module MP1, which is a combination of the power supply, 5 volt power supply with the barrel plug, as well as an RF modulator. You can plug this cable into the CPC, it outputs an RGB signal, the RGB signal is going to be converted into a composite signal and then there's an RF modulator in here and an antenna cable to connect it to your television set. Usually the CPC 464 was only sold in combination with the monitor, so uh, I don't know why this thing exists at all. Maybe if you wanted to connect it to a television set, which at that point in time in the 80s, most of them only had RF input, so this was pretty handy to do that. The power supply usually for the Amstrad CPC 464 is located in the monitor, which is a pretty, pretty elegant solution. So you just hooked up the monitor to the mains and you could power your CPC from a cable that came from the monitor. So pretty neat solution actually. Although of course you were kind of stuck with that monitor or you could hook up an RGB monitor with a proper cable, obviously. I don't have a CPC monitor at all, but I have this. As usual for the time, these things are not very well made power supplies, uh, as we're going to see. We're going to take a look inside and do some modifications to this. The RF modulator probably is not the highest quality at all, but I think I want to restore this to a state where it's actually usable and a lot safer than it used to be. I kind of like the idea of having this as my power supply for the CPC because it just uh, looks like it belongs to the CPC, because it does. I kind of like the old hardware, as you probably know. I love tinkering with old hardware. So we're going to take this apart, take a look at the circuit and do some minor or not so minor modifications to this. We are going to see. I have some ideas not quite sure which ones are doable. Let me take a couple of seconds to thank the sponsor for this video, PCBWay, my favorite manufacturer of prototype PCBs. They also offer 3D printing and CNC machining services and they have quite some celebrations coming up. Their fifth PCB design contest is currently running and you can send in your design and win some awesome prizes. They also have their eighth anniversary coming up, eight years of PCBWay and there's a lot of discounts going on currently so I highly recommend even more than usual to check out their website. The link is in the video description. Back to our video. So the first step is going to be opening this up. Uh, by the way this came from Great Britain uh, from Anthony who also donated the CPC itself and of course this had a British uh, style plug which doesn't fit my Euro style uh, main sockets, so we are going to have to do something about that. But first of all, let's cut this tape which uh, holds this together. We don't even have to cut it, I guess. You can just unwrap it like a present, which it technically is because it was a donation. So this should now lift up. Okay, so the case seems to be intact actually, but the screws were missing. Yeah, so as usual, this is a pretty cheaply made linear power supply. There's two 5 volt regulators here, a huge transformer, 
with actually two separate output windings. I think both of these should provide around 9 volts AC, which is then transported through these wires, uh, rectified actually with two diodes, smoothed out with these large capacitors, I guess. And then this whole portion here is the RF modulator circuit, which has an, let's see, what's the part number? MC1377, which is a commonly used uh, RGB to composite converter chip. And uh, this whole circuit here is provided with 12 volts, which is also generated on this side of the board here. And even shoddier, there's only one diode, I believe, uh, to rectify that in one capacitor and one Zener diode, I think, to regulate that. This chip has its own regulator in it, so it's not that important to have a smooth input voltage. And you can see these two wires here coming from the power supply board to this board. I guess these are the 12 volt supply wires for this board. And then we have our antenna cable, which actually literally plugs in, there's a plug here, into this modulator and then gets fed out <laughs> at the bottom here. And yeah, that's basically it. So uh, not much going on here. I would say uh, we should take this out of the case because the case needs a good scrubbing anyway. And then we're going to take a closer look. There's some screws that we need to remove to get this out that screw into screw posts. Wow, okay, this is kind of rotted. That's our modulator part. And then this power supply board actually is loose. There's only one screw here. And these screws for connecting the voltage regulators to the heatsink. So this should now come out, I think. Yes. Oh yeah, there's another screw here. Okay. That's unusual. Now, if we can get the screw out, yeah, we can. We are free. <laughs> yeah, so these parts are going to take a bit of a bath. This could potentially be removed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that is some dry glue. I actually found a schematic for this on the mighty CPC wiki site, which is going to be linked in the video description. It's not really necessary, but it makes things easier to explain. Let me try and explain this circuit as far as I can understand it. So we have our transformer with our live and neutral from the mains coming into the primary side. Then we have our secondary side. This actually is a center tapped transformer. So it has four output terminals, uh, which have, I think both of these pairs have nine volts AC on them. So we have this little circuit here on the top going coming from terminal three. That is our 12 volt circuit. And as you can see, we have a 12 volt output here. We have a ground coming from this terminal. So that's probably ground on the transformer, terminal five. That's our common ground for everything here. And it is a floating ground. Uh, there's no mains earth connection or anything in this, just two wires, neutral and live coming in. And this is basically a half wave rectifier, pretty crude that doesn't, uh, it just uses one diode. This is a standard one N4001 and a resistor for some load. Uh, basically, this is the, the crudest form of a rectifier that you can probably imagine just using one diode and then uh, a capacitor to smooth things out. And I think this is a Zener diode uh, slightly bringing the voltage down before it reaches our RF modulator circuit, which the 12 volts is for. That's exclusively for the RF modulator circuit. Uh, on this thing here, we have a full wave rectification that uses two diodes. That is possible because we have a center tapped 
transformer. Usually for a full bridge rectifier you would use four diodes at least. There's also some that use more diodes I think. But uh, this is a full wave rectifier that uses the center tab on this transformer. The way that it works is that one of these tabs outputs the AC wave like this. This is a full AC wave and the other one does the inverse thing. So you basically uh, use one diode for this and that's going to let through the voltage that goes into one direction, the positive for example, and the other one is also going to let through the positive and you still as a result get something like this, only positive waves output and you can then smooth that with these capacitors and feed it into the linear voltage regulators and the output is going to be super smooth 5 volts even if you don't use a 4 diode full bridge rectifier. But that's only possible because you have these inverse waves on the center tab. That's basically how this works. We have the 12 volt circuit which is super crude but it doesn't need to be sophisticated so they cut some cost there. I guess you could also use separate windings on a transformer for example that has two 9 volt terminals. You could, could put proper rectification in here and have a separate 12 volts rail. But that's not what they did. These two 7805C as you can see they are in parallel so both of these are going to output 5 volts and the amperage is adding up between them. This is probably the cheapest way to achieve that. I'm sure Amstrad thought about that a lot. <laughs> hey, it's Jan from the future. I'm actually just editing the video you are watching right now. So uh, kind of a pre or rather post amble about some of the things I did. As usual this is not anything like a tutorial video or anything like that. I'm just figuring out stuff live basically recording things in chronological order and I made some wrong assumptions uh, during filming this video. Uh, in the process I'm replacing the two diodes with a full bridge rectifier which consists of four diodes which doesn't really make sense in that configuration but I thought it would. I apologize uh, and I considered just completely reshooting the video which was kind of difficult because I already did all the modifications and I would have to tinker with the voiceover and things like that. So I decided to just go through it and continue in chronological order but I am uh, righting the wrongs during the course of the video as you are going to see. So uh, don't take this as a tutorial, don't take any advice from me regarding electronics. I'm not a professional electronics person, I'm just kind of a self-taught YouTuber, hobbyist, uh, retro computer. -er. I'm learning new things all the time. I put some links in the video description explaining the difference between uh, the two diode full wave rectification and the full bridge rectification that you can read up on. I didn't know, so maybe you learn something as well. With that out of the way, let's continue with the video. Couple of modifications that I can think of right off the top of my head. Maybe it's a good idea to replace this with a proper full bridge rectifier. And for the 12 volt rail, I'm not even sure what I'm going to do. I'm definitely going to replace all the electrolytic capacitors in this and probably also replace the voltage regulators. And then of course we have this uh, loose end here on the mains input cable. These UK plugs have a glass fuse in them usually uh, that is the mains fuse for a device like this which is desperately needed for fire protection basically uh, in case the transformer shorts its winding windings it's going to get hot really quickly and until the circuit breaker breaks there's going to be some time for this to go up in flames so basically we have to add a fuse to this uh, internally we're going to have to work out something in that regard another idea that i have is actually making the modulator switchable kind of yeah if you put a switch in here 
we can just shut down the RF modulator completely because most of the times, to be honest, I'm not going to use that at all. Probably we're going to make that switchable if I can fit a switch somewhere. Yeah, so that's the plan. Replace all the capacitors on here, make the 12 volts rail completely switchable so it doesn't consume any power or very little power if I switch it right after the secondary windings on the transformer. And also I need to add a fuse. And maybe I want to put a kind of crude overvoltage protection into the 5 volts rail at the end of the 5 volt rail. I'm just going to replace the electrolytic capacitors on the power supply board here, which is a good idea because according to the date codes on the components or on this chip here, this was made in 84. So yeah, they are pretty old. Just using my desoldering station here to get these capacitors out. This is only a single-sided board, so it's super easy to desolder these and replace them. And while I'm here, I'm also going to clean this up a bit. <laughs> Just using isopropanol to clean up the board. There's a lot of nasty dust on there. As replacement capacitors, I'm using these uh, Panasonic FC series ones. They don't have a hilariously low ESR uh, for modern caps. These are mostly aimed at audio equipment and things like that. So these are very suitable for old school applications like this older devices. Usually these work very well for these use cases. And as you can see, they are also smaller than the original ones. Yeah. So that's my electrolytic capacitors on this board replaced. I'm probably going to do these as well. Now for adding a bridge rectifier. Bridge rectifiers usually look something like this. They come in some different form factors. This is a particularly huge one uh, rated at a thousand volts and 10 amps, I believe. Don't need a hilariously large bridge rectifier like this, but this is what I had at hand and I think maybe I can fit it somewhere instead of these two diodes, which are the rectification that is built in here. So basically what we are going to have to do is to connect these uh, secondary windings four and seven, or the outputs on the secondary windings where the diodes are connected. We're going to connect these to the AC portion of this bridge rectifier, which basically is four diodes internally. So it acts as four diodes combined. Could also add additional diodes there, but I'm just going to go with this because I don't trust these diodes after uh, nearly 40 years. Anyway, so this basically the input pins for the AC voltage are on the center pins here. And then we have a positive and a negative portion, which is smoother than the uh, AC already. And then that can additionally be smoothed out with the capacitors that we have in place anyway. So that should work fine. Basically nine volts AC goes in here and we get a slightly higher DC output on the plus and minus terminals here that we are going to have to connect to this point where these diodes connect, which is just the positive terminal of all these capacitors. So probably we're going to find a way to mount this some way. So I think we can definitely remove uh, those diodes altogether because we are replacing them with something that hopefully works better. And there we go. These are 1N5402, actually. So these are super beefy. Uh, they are designated here as 1N5401, which is probably plenty. 
these are even higher rated. The 5401 are rated 400 volts and 3 amps, so these are probably higher. And as you can see on our board here, these are the positive sides of the diodes where they were connected. That's where our 9 volts AC comes in from both of our windings. And then this whole portion here where the negative end of the diodes and the rectified signal or rectified voltage is, is connected together. It's just one copper layer here. And uh, of course our smoothing capacitors are also connected to that. And then so is our voltage regulators, the input sides of those. So what we're going to have to do is to find a way to connect the AC. Uh, one side should go here and the other side should be connected to here. And uh, our positive we can connect to either one of these, I think. That should be enough because they are connected anyway. And the negative goes to ground. I think it might be a good idea to have this sitting here and just use some wire to connect it to the other one. Probably bending these up. This is the negative. So we could potentially solder this in like so and run these wires. Probably going to solder this down like this and then uh, connect our negative to probably to the ground on the capacitor there. I think our grounds are all connected anyway. And the AC, we are going to run a wire from this winding here. So we want our other AC from where the AC, the other diode went. So we're just going to run a wire there, I guess. So I'm just going to run a wire from this point here, where the AC input on the other diode was, <laughs> and run it to my, my AC input on here. So this is what this looks like. Now we still have our ground to connect actually. So we are going to have to run wire to the ground from somewhere. So this is our ground pad here where the ground from the transformer comes in. And as you can see all the components, all the grounds are connected together basically. I'm probably just going to run a wire. I'm just going to run a wire from here. We're going to run a wire to the back of the circuit board. Okay, that should be our bridge rectifier connected. So I uh, ran one of the AC wires from this AC input to this AC pin and put some heat shrink tubing over that, which has some hot glue in it, so it's staying in place. I also ran the ground to this point where ground actually is on the transformer, so it is pretty much uh, very much according to the original circuitry. For the voltage regulators I'm going to use my usual 78S05 which are rated at 2 amps, slightly higher than the ones that were in here. So these should be fine for this purpose. It's going to be a bit tricky to place these because these uh, supposedly screw into the heatsink and we need to determine the height of the screw. It's tricky, 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 tricky. It's not that tricky. Screw holes are pretty large on these, so we have some leeway. So I'm uh, going to clean up the heatsink with some IPA. 
So, uh, I want to add a very crude way of overvoltage protection to the 5 volt rail in this power supply. Because it is, even if we made it a bit smoother, it is pretty shoddy still uh, with these 7805s that have some kind of overvoltage protection built in. But uh, sometimes they can short out and then basically the voltage on the input, which is much higher than 5 volts, is output if they are internally shorted to the output side and then into the CPC, which is going to fry most of the chips instantly. So what I did on some C64s, I used these P6KE 6.8A. Uh, transient voltage suppression diodes. These are basically starting to uh, conduct at a voltage of 6.8 volts. And basically what I'm going to do is to use one of these and put it across the output of this power supply. So if the 5 volts on the output reaches a level of 6.8 volts, it is going to short out. And that should shut down the power. So it, it should short out to ground, that should shut down the voltage supply in an instant. And uh, yeah, that's a crude way of doing it, but kind of an e effective way. Probably going to put one across these two points, which are our output. So I'm going to solder one of these in here with the ring on the diode actually facing the positive and the other end facing the negative, so uh, that it just blocks voltage as long as there is no overvoltage. And if there is overvoltage, it just shorts these two out. So that is going to prevent our chips in the CPC from being fried, hopefully. And I put some Kapton tape under there because these can get pretty warm and the Kapton tape is kind of a heat resistant tape. So this also is going to protect the board a tiny little bit. Some heatsink compound on these and then the screws should go back in. I'm going to add some uh, hot glue to these capacitors so they don't rattle around too much because the transformer is going to vibrate a tiny little bit and also same goes for all the components, basically, because at least the ones that see some kind of AC, they are moving a tiny little bit. <laughs> so, tiny bits of glue. We don't even know if this works at all yet, so uh, yeah, probably getting ahead of myself here. We should so put some thermal compound on these and screw this in and then actually test this. So this is just a uh, vermilite pasta, heat conductive paste that is uh, usually used for transistors. So it's not the uh, modern PC kind of heat conductive paste. This is made for lower temperatures, but uh, it works for transistors and voltage regulators and things like that. This is the stuff that gets usually gets used for that kind of operation. So uh, yeah, I'm just going to screw these into the heatsink there again. I replaced the electrolytic capacitors on this RF modulator board as well now. And yeah, it's about time we do some testing of this. Uh, as I said, I'm going to connect a whole new mains power cable here. And I want to add a mains fuse to this. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of room. If we put this together, uh, this board sits around here, yeah. So we have all the room we have is in this compartment here. So we are going to drill a hole for this nice chunky fuse holder into this top case. I think it has to go something like here. I marked that roughly <laughs> with the red marker. And then we are going to wire this fuse on the live wire before it goes into the transformer, I think. Yeah, but before I drill this hole, I want to wire this up so we can do some testing. 
I'm going to use some wires that I'm probably going to salvage from this existing mains cable to wire this fuse in. So, got the fuse holder connected. <clears throat> it should go something like here. I'm going to put a one amp slow blow fuse in here for now. I think that should be more than enough. And I am going to disconnect some of these wires here to measure the output of the transformer before I power the whole device. So I'm going to remove these orange ones that go to our 5 volt power supply section. So yeah, let's try and do that. So I can measure the transformer output, let's see if that is accurate. This is where it gets a bit dangerous because we're going to plug in our mains plug at this point and just hope for the best. I'm just going to plug this into the mains and see if it explodes or blows the fuse. It makes really funny noises. That's not good. Maybe the transformer is blown. <laughs> that would be fine. So let's see. Let's try that again. No noise from the transformer. So that's 6.5 volts. Okay. Do that for the other terminals. That's 0.4. Transformer is shot. Our transformer just started smoking. That's not a good sign. Ah, okay, so we have a broken transformer in here. That is not supposed to happen. Ha, ah, okay, that was a bit unexpected. Should have tested the transformer before I did anything else. Good thing I disconnected it from the rest of the circuit. Uh, I think what happened is that uh, the windings shorted out internally, or at least uh, there's some kind of intermittent short between. The windings in the uh, secondary, one of the secondary sides, uh, side windings. So, a uh, couple of options. I think what I want to do is to just completely get rid of the RF circuit for now. Uh, I don't have a proper replacement uh, transformer for this one that has two secondary winding uh, outputs uh, with appropriate strength. I have a 9 volt AC transformer here though that should be chunky enough to power the 5 volt power supply. I hope that's an option. Of course we could uh, put something in here like a meanwhile proper switching power supply which would probably be an even better solution technically. But I refurbished this whole circuit now. Uh, so I kind of want to use this. We could remove this wire here, which is only for the supply of the 12 volt supply side. Could cut this and the yellow one. Going to remove this, put this in, which is a single uh, 9 volt AC output. This is a 10VA transformer. Not quite sure about the power that this outputs. It's chunkier than this one. But this also powers uh, both of the power supplies. Probably should use a beefier one for that purpose. This gets a bit uh, heck jobby again. We can get rid of this thing altogether. I think we're just going to cut the wires. Didn't take into account that transformers can also break. I would rather have guessed that something in the circuit is broken. So we're going to have to remove this whole thing. I kind of want to know if my circuit works. <laughs> they rounded these uh, screws. That's not nice. These are screws, but they have been filed down, so you can't get a good grip on them. That can't stop me! Okay, testing the new transformer. That doesn't make any hilariously loud noises. That's a good sign. And we get... 11 volts AC on the output side, which is totally okay without a load. Nice. Adding some heat shrink tubing. These are the two wires that are used for the 5 volt power supply. 
connected to the output. So at this point we should basically have a simple linear power supply that outputs 5 volts on this plug, hopefully. I'm just going to power this on and see if my reworked circuit does what it's supposed to do. Okay, I'm plugging this in. Let's see if it explodes right away. Didn't explode right away. Let's see if we get 5 volts on the output. Should be center positive 5 volts. Yes indeed! 5.27 volts! It does what it's supposed to do. Let's see if we get AC ripple. I'm switching this to AC. Should be very low. Yeah, and as you can see, it's still going down. 0 0.0007 volts of AC ripple from the mains. So this is a pretty clean power supply. It's a linear one, so that's to be expected. And there's no high frequency ripple. Just hope this is powerful enough to actually power the CPC. That took some unexpected turns. Uh, I think I want to drill some holes for the transformer at this point and maybe put this in the case. And I'm just drilling some 4mm holes here, which is what the screws are, I think. <laughs> and the screws are not long enough. Yay. We need longer screws. Turns out I don't have long enough screws for uh, mounting this. It's not the proper direction to mount this anyway. It should be mounted with the screw holes uh, under these tabs here. I think I'm going to go with cable ties probably. That's uh, kind of hacky, but yeah, that's how I work. We're going to be fine. So I managed to screw this down with the new screw in the case here uh, should sit strongly enough. Four millimeter pilot hole and the rest is going to be done with uh, a step drill. That should be enough. Yeah. I think that turned out pretty nicely. I'm going to remove this uh, marking here, which I don't need anymore, with some alcohol. The 5 volt output cable also got reattached to this strain relief. And uh, the mains cable, there's the strain relief in the case actually that winds this around a couple of times. Works pretty well. So we're going to leave that as is. Uh, I need to find some screws because it didn't come with any screws that fit these holes here in the case. Maybe these ones. Just probably standard size plastic screws. All closed up. I read up on a couple of things and I have several things to note about this uh, modified MP1 that I made. First of all, uh, using a full bridge rectifier in place of a center tap full wave rectifier with the two diodes that was in here originally is not really going to work because we have, uh, as for the center tap, the AC is inverse. So we have, if we have a peak on the outer tap, we have a low at the inner tap. So it would basically not work correctly with a full bridge rectifier that I put in there. So thankfully I put a non-center tap uh, transformer in here that is going to work as intended with a full bridge rectifier. So no point in replacing those diodes with a full bridge rectifier. I got that a bit wrong, not recommended. <laughs> Don't do it as I did with the center tap transformer. Another thing about the transformer, this is really kind of underpowered for this purpose. I read that the CPC-464 uses up to 2 amperes of power and that's super marginal with this transformer that I used. That's a 10VA transformer. So 9 volts at 10VA 
equal about 1.1111111 amperes and that would be slightly under 2 amperes if you don't add any losses for 5 volts. So yeah, it is kind of marginal. I would suggest using a bigger transformer. I'm going to order one and put one in here at some point. Uh, I think if you don't use the tape drive on the CPC, which is also powered by the 5 volts from the power supply, we should get away with this, but not recommended. So don't do it like I did. Use a proper large transformer if you want to do the mods I did. Otherwise, this should act as a proper power supply now, apart from the fact that it's slightly underpowered. The trap drive in my CPC is broken anyway, so we are probably going to get away with it. We're going to find out. Yeah, at least I learned some things. <laughs> Again, as usual. I'm just going to clean this batch with some IPA and put it back on there with some double stick tape. Just putting two strips on here. Then even if it doesn't work, it's going to look nice. <laughs> and as I said, you could just put a modern switching power supply into this. Maybe I'll end up doing that just for the sake of uh, ending this video on kind of a positive note. At least it looks good now. <laughs> and the backside also looks kind of neat and we added a fuse, which is a nice touch. Yeah, 5 volt 2 amp is also what it says here. Should have looked at that side earlier. Do not remove any screws. Oh, look, our own power supply gives me a super crisp picture actually on the TV. Okay, the RGB out from the CPC is exceptionally good, actually. Ah. So yeah, our power supply works. We can even use the tape, but this is completely broken anyway, so I'm not going to use that. Doesn't really get overly hot so far. I'm just going to let this run for a while and see if anything occurs, which is a deal breaker. But I suppose this is not too bad. So it's about an hour later and the power supply got a bit warm, which is to be expected, obviously. But nothing gets overly hot or anything. And it still works as well. And the CPC is printing my name still. <laughs> I think we made, at least made a working power supply out of this. Fortunately, we found the fault with the original transformer and removed it all together and modified this to be a full bridge rectified uh, power supply, which has its advantages, but it's not the original circuit anymore. Uh, we had to take the whole RF circuit out. I can still refit that, which I'm probably going to end up doing. I I'm going to keep that. I think this looks pretty neat. That's the, the most important thing, I guess. <laughs> An easier way to mod this would be to put a 5 volt 2 amps plus uh, modern switching power supply inside and just use the original cables. That would probably be the better option because usually these modern switching power supplies have over voltage protection and uh, are fused internally. So yeah, that would be a nicer option if you just want a power supply. It's still better than a totally non-working unit, I guess, but it's not what I expected. I think that's it for today. Uh, as I said, things didn't go quite as expected. Some things went downhill quickly, but I hope this still was an informative and entertaining video. Thank you so much for watching. Thanks to my Patreon supporters and everybody who supports me on the YouTube channel memberships page and also to the people who make single donations via Ko-fi and PayPal. Thank you so very much. The links are in the video description in case you want to give me some support if you found this interesting. There's going to be more retro computer stuff pretty soon and also some audio stuff. So stay tuned on this channel if you like. 
uh, hit the subscribe button, don't forget to ring the bell and things like that, that YouTubers say. I hate that stuff, but usually it works. So if you are not subscribed, hit the subscribe button. And if you don't want to miss a video, hit the little bell and you get notifications from YouTube. Anyway, thanks for watching. I'm Jan Beter. See you next time. Bye.